thank you again. So now I will talk more about um, how polarizable embedding QMMM works. So, well, I don't think I need the motivation, but just to recap, uh, one of the most important things, and you know, because in, you are in the condensed phase uh, institute or lab, we are interested in the chemistry that occurs in condensed phase, where usually, not always, but in many processes, we have molecule and so on. Uh, a molecule or a system of interest which is embedded in some kind of environment where we have a bulk of the environment but we also have some specific interactions. So for example here we have hydrogen bonds. So uh, and in particular light driven processes are really affected by this environment. Um, so, for example, absorption and fluorescence, also dynamics, nonlinear spectroscopy, whatever. Um, so we want to resort to multi-scale QM classical models. And there are basically two ways to do this. One is continuum models. I, I won't talk about these, but just to, to mention them, where we don't have fixed electrostatics, but we have a cavity and we assume that the solvent, the environment, is a dielectric that can reorient and respond to the solute's density. So we have no charges around, well, not fixed charges around. We have, oh, sorry. We have charges, polarization charges, in response to, the, to a density. So in, instead, in atomistic models, you usually have QMMM, so you have fixed charges on the MM atoms. And if you want to introduce polarization, you can do several things. And one possibility is to introduce induced dipoles. So each atom can bear a fixed a point charge, but also a point dipole can, that can be induced by uh, an electric field. And the idea is uh, we want to use this kind of multi-scale models to describe light-driven processes. So let's start and go directly to the QMMM poll method. So with QMMM poll, I, I mean QMMM where you introduce polarization uh, as induced dipoles. So you have your QM part where you have this density and of course you have the nuclei but the important thing is that, that you have uh, extended let's say electron density of some kind and this interacts with charges of the solvent or environment but also with induced dipoles and these dipoles can be induced by the external field and can polarize back the QM part. So this is the important part. So you can decide to, to write the energy in this way. So you have the QM energy that depends on the density and or wave function. And then you have QMMM part, which includes, let's say, the QMMM interaction and all the MM uh, the electrostatics and polarization part of the MM. So if you write down this um, idea in the case of charges and induced dipoles, you have something like this. You have the interaction between charges and charges. You have the interaction between charges and QM density. So VQM is the potential induced by the QM density. And then you have the polarizable part. So this is the part that you usually have in electrostatic embedding, normal QMMM. This is, let's say, the easy part. And then you have the polarizable terms, where you have the interaction between induced dipoles, and you have 
the interactions between the induced dipoles and the mm charges and between the induced dipoles and the qm density so this is the electric field generated by the qm charge the mm charges and this is the electric field generated by the qm density so here the the mm charges can be described exactly as you do the nuclei of the qm part but then you have also the dipoles so you have to do something different um, so one important part is the self-interaction between the induced EP, IPD, induced point dipoles. Um, so this is a dipole-dipole interaction. And the important thing is here is that this diverges for small distances, which means that you are likely to undergo the polarization, what is called polarization catastrophe, which means that when the distance is small, this interaction can explode, and if, if these dipoles are induced one by another, they both go to infinity. So we need some kind of screened Coulomb kernel, where this interaction is exactly equal to this one for large distances, but then goes to a finite value at shorter distance. And this, there, so this is like the uh, the Leonard Jones one of our the twelve. Yeah, kind, 12, of, kind yeah, of, kind of, yeah. yes. And oh, well, this is similar to uh, dispersion corrections in DFT, which is because they are like the green mid dispersion yeah. D three. Yeah, they also have a kind of screening at short distances. So one over R6. R6. Yeah, yeah, one over R6. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here you can derive these formulas, for example, assuming that the, the dipoles are not point dipoles but Gaussian charges, charges yeah. or something like that. And could you go back to the first slide? Sure. And so the, these alphas are the, polar, the atomic polarizability. Exactly. So each atom bears a Polarizability, which in this case is isotropic, which is um, the same. So the polarizability for every element is the same. Uh, not except for every atom type is the same, but we have just a few atom types. Uh, so, it, so you can have different uh, oxygen types that have different polarizations. For example, yes, you can. Okay. You this, this is uh, yes, this is something you fit. This is your fit. Okay, fine. But it's easy to fit, actually. Um, anyway, so we take this and we want to write it in this way. Okay, so with a tensor inside here. So the tensor should look something like this. So if these were ones, one and one, we would have the same thing as this one. But then we can introduce these factors that are distance-dependent factors that basically help screening the, uh, the potential when we, we have small distance between two di different dipoles. And then, since we have molecules, we know that the bonding of these molecules, we also have uh, connectivity dependent screening factors. So for example, if two atoms are two mm atoms are bonded to each other, they their dipoles don't feel each other. So F R0. And if they are one three neighbors, they also don't feel each other. So you come up you come up with um, a formula for these two screening factors and with a set of exclusion rules and then you can compute this tensor and if you um, if you take this matrix here ij so on the diagonal you have the inverse of the polarizabilities and then you have this if you take this and you invert it you get the polarizability of the system so you can do it for a molecule you can calculate the polarizability and fit the atomic polarizability <coughs> so that 
the molecular colorizability works. And but where you do this, uh, how exactly do you do this on uh, on different molecules. molecules in isolation? Yes. Then, uh, so how, when, then when you put them in, uh, in an environment, yeah, uh, those polarizabilities would be different. Well, you assume you know, that they are. So you assume that yes. the same, and I guess there's good reason. I guess the changes will be very small. Yes. Yeah. The electronic polarizers will exactly. not change much. Exactly. So yeah. basically, once you have a set of rules, so how you construct this tensor, you can compute either the response to a field or directly the polarizability, and you can tune the atomic polarizability so that the molecular one works. But it turns out that you just need couple of different atom types for some elements to reproduce polarizabilities quite well. So we, ha we actually never refit polarizabilities. Oh, oh. I don't know. This is good. Um, so Now let's go sorry, back no, to no, the... Sorry, let's go back, sorry, just to... So then, uh, okay, so I understand distance dependent then exclusion rules. Uh, so Fe and Fg are zero for bond neighbors. Uh, okay, so basically if things are covalently linked to each other. Yes, so let, let's say you have a MM force field, so you, you, you know the connectivity, mm -hmm. or you, you have a system whose connectivity you know in the MM part. And so if two atoms are bonded, they are one, two neighbors, and they don't feel each other. If they are one, three neighbors, they still don't feel each other. One, four, they still don't feel each other. One, five, there could be a, a, a scaling factor. This depends on the exact force. Yeah. Yeah. So you first decide the rules, then you fit the polarizabilities, and you see if it works. There are a lot of possibilities, but they kind of work quite well. The important thing is that you need to screen some part of this tensor. Okay, so uh, let's go back to the energy. So you can come up for this energy, uh, and of course we will include the QM energy at, an, at some point. And I just want you to notice that this sum here is kind of a scalar product, okay? Because it's a sum of new I times um, all the electric field. So times dipole, induced dipoles times the electric field, each component, each atom, okay? So sometimes I will write something like this, so like a just to a shorthand notation, uh, also to show that this is a bit bilinear form. Okay, so if you take all of these and you take the part that depends on the dipoles and then you minimize with respect to the induced dipoles, you variationally minimize, you get this equation here, which is a system of equations. So your unknowns are the dipoles and you know these fields. Okay, so this is just the field of the charges. So you can write this in this way. So this A matrix contains on the diagonal on the diagonal the inverse of the polarizability and off diagonal of all of these parts of the tensor. And this is the external field that contains both the QM and the fixed charges. So basically, you solve this linear system and you find the induced point, point dipoles. And we are sure that these induced point dipoles minimize this energy. So the energy is, the, the energy is stationary with respect to the dipoles. Uh, then we uh, um, so in practice, 
the in practice yeah yeah i, I will you, you show that okay. yes right then we minimize for example let's let's say we are in r 4 for dft ground state you the qm energy is something like this nuclear plus okay nuclear it's like the anon charges then you have the the mon electronic term bi electronic term if you minimize this with respect to the density matrix, you, you find the SCF equations. So you have the fork. Uh, if you minimize the whole QM plus QMMN with respect to the density matrix, you find a similar thing, and you find that your fork uh, matrix is this is the in vacuum one. Then you have this part that is just the field of the charges, this is what you get in uh, electrostatic embedding, which is mono-electronic, and then you, ha you have a part that is bi-electronic, this V-pole. Now, V-pole means different things in different uh, parts. So here, you do the minimization, and you find out that this part is sum of mu i times this uh, electric field. So this is the mu nu uh, term of the that you have to add to the Fock operator, okay? And it contains the dipoles. So these are the induced dipoles. So these are these depend on the density matrix. So here I write this, and these are matrix elements of the electric field operator, and. So they are defined in this way. Or I could just put the electric field here. OK, so these you can compute. If you have a QM code, you can ask, compute my, uh, the electric field of my density matrix at this point. Usually, you are interested in computing the uh, potential, but you also can compute the field. OK, so you can do this with most uh, integral libraries. So you have this electrode. OK, so we know how to change the Fock operator. OK, so in practice, what we do is we take the QM density matrix. We compute the electric field at the MM atom positions. So in this way, we, we have this electric field integrals, we contract with the density matrix. Then we have, I don't know why we have one everywhere. We compute the induced dipoles from the external field, which is QM electric field, this one, plus the one from the charges. And we solve the linear system. Then we, when we have the induced dipoles, we can compute the contribution to the fork. And finally, we iterate until convergence. So basically, we can uh, so go back to the um, the magnitude of EQ. Sorry, yeah, magnitude of EQM versus EQ. EQM is typically much larger, or not necessarily. Uh, depends, depends on the system, but if you are far from the QM part, yes, it's the largest part. Okay. Because uh, these can decay when you go far from the QM part, but if your MN part has as well charges, yeah. then yes, this is the most important part. Okay, so just to have a scheme, you you have you build your fork operator, you compute the um, potential and field from the QM part, you solve for the induced dipoles, you compute the QMMM energy, and you put this part back into the fork. You solve, when you have the fork or conscious matrix, you solve again the, the SCF, you get the electronic density, you check the convergence, if you are not converged, you compute again the field, you compute again the induced dipoles, and, and so on. Okay, so at every time, at every SCF cycle, you have to find the induced dipole solving a linear system. 
So basically, every MD step you have. Um... Every MD step you have many SCF cycles, yeah. and you have to converge. Yeah. So I don't know. Usually, you may have uh, six, nine, or ten, or twelve SCF cycles. Okay. Iterations. At, at every iteration, you need to find the typos. I see. And um, is there you gain by taking advantage of of history? We can see. Okay. Okay. So basically, in the QM and pol and pol energy, you have the QM energy, the uh, energy of the charges, the bilinear QM inducing point in dipole and charge inducing point in dipole interaction, and the quadratic self energy of the induced point in dipoles. Um, and then, if you take this energy and minimize variationally, you get both what are how you find the induced point in dipoles and how what you can you, what you have to put in the QM Hamiltonian or the fog. Now this is easy if you have SCF because you are already iterating. You already have uh, um, the SCF iterations already in vacuum, so you just have something more to compute at every SCF step. Um, I'm not going into this, but if you have a post SCF um, thing, you you have to do external iterations, which is more complicated. But in theory, you can do everything like this, especially if your QM QM method is variational. Here, everything is variational, so we are fine. Okay. One thing that is not variational is amoeba. So, why we need amoeba? Because amoeba is a complete force field. But it's more complicated. First of all, it doesn't just have fixed charges, but it also has fixed dipoles and fixed quadrupoles. So, the fixed electrostatics is, is more complicated because you, you have to compute the interactions between all multiples up to order 2. And then, for some reason, the polarization energy is not variational because there are two sets, two different sets of induced point cycles. So the variational formulation is not possible. We need to use a Lagrangian formulation, which looks like this one. So this self-energy of the multiples is the same thing as the self-energy of the charges, but now we have multiples. And here is the polarizable, polarizable part and basically we have one set of dipoles that only interacts with uh, the uh, QM electrostatics and another ten set of dipoles that also interacts with the fixed multiples and they have different exclusion rules and different streaming so you you basically compute them different. So the second term there. Yes. Uh, basically, the, the quadruple. Yeah. Uh, can induce a dipole. Yes. On yes. The, okay. So you oh, have I see. charges, charges, dipoles, and quadruples. You can compute their total electric field again on the uh, mm atoms and then you compute this they interact with mu p but they don't interact with mu d yeah. it's a bit complicated no, I see. or they interact differently with mu d and mu d don't interact among themselves it's a bit <laughs> it's a mess but if you do the same kind of minimization, you find that the contribution to the FOP is similar, but you have so to account for both dipoles. Can you go back? So, yes. um, so then in all of this, um, you do E-wild sum. 
Uh, no. no. They are done differently, at least in uh, Filippo's implementation. Um, we do fast multiples. Okay, so it's another. Yes. Okay, some variant to uh, get yes. the long range vector study. Yes, exactly. It's, uh, it's okay. another fast dimension method. Yeah. Right. But I don't go into this because uh, I, don't <laughs> I don't know the details. Anyway, so here you have two different set of coupled systems of equations, so it's more complicated <laughs> to solve, but you can do basically, it's almost the same thing, just a bit more complicated. Um, and now, uh, if you have the, a way to have the energies, you, the energy you can do the derivatives and get the forces. So if you have a variational or a Lagrangian framework, both the energy and the Lagrangian, in the case of amoeba, are stationary with respect to the dipoles, so the, deriva the derivatives are easier to compute. I don't show all the terms, but basically if you have the derivatives with, with respect to the QM atom positions, you have, for example, for the charges, you have the interaction of the charge with the derivative of the uh, potential with respect to the positions. So these, again, are uh, integrals. And for the polarization energy, same thing, you have interaction of the dipoles with the derivative of the electric field. And then for the electrostatics, this is the electrostatic part for the MM part. For the electrostatics, it's just the interaction of the charge with the derivative of the potential, which is the electric field. And then for the polarization part, you have the interaction of the dipole with the gradient of the field. And then also you have the fact that the interaction between two dipoles to induce dipole changes. So you have the derivative of the interaction tensor. But this is, these are two similar things because here you compute the gradient of the, of the QM field and it's contraction with the dipoles, and here, this on the, on the right or on the left, is the gradient of the field in created, generated by the dipoles, uh, that interacts with the same dipoles, with the other dipoles. And because these dipoles are because the energy is stationary with respect to the dipoles, you don't need to have the derivative of the dipoles themselves. So you first compute, when you, when you know the induced dipoles, you just compute the derivatives in this way. You don't need to know how they change. Okay, um, so basically, you need for electrostatic terms, you have up to order L, you have to compute the L plus one derivative of the potential. So if you are up to quadruple, if you, if you have charges, you have to compute electric field. If you have dipoles, you, you have to, to compute the electric field gradient. And if you have quadruples, you need to compute electric field Hessian. So you, you have to compute this for the dipoles, for, for the fixed multiples themselves, and for the induced dipoles, and for uh, the QM part. So in particular, you need a QM uh, code that com can compute these integrals. So for example, libint or libsint, these are three centers to electron integrals. Okay, uh, so let's go ahead to the response and excited states. So for example, when you uh, use the DDFT, um, excited states are 
computed as folds of a response equation. So you have this linear response, but the linear response is also more general. So if you have an external perturbation like an electric field, you can compute the response to this external perturbation with coupled perturbed equations. Uh, so this, for example, for frequency dependent polarization, you have something like this. Also for ma magnetic properties, you have something like this. Um, if you don't have this part, you get to the Casida TDDFT equations. And these A and B matrices are the Hessian of the energy with respect to the density matrix. So, in normal TDDFT, you can compute these. Uh, but what happens, I, I don't show them, but what happens if you have the environment, well, you can take the, your, your uh, environment, only two electron terms go into the Hessian, so the effect of the charges doesn't, the charges don't go here. So if you only have charges, these terms you compute like in normal TDDFT, but if you have polarization, which is two electron uh, property, you get an additional term inside here. Uh, or explicit. So this is a term, the same term is added both to the A and to the B matrices. And this term lo looks like this. So it's the, the, the product of this electric field integral. So now I'm, I'm looking in a molecular orbital uh, basis. So I and J are occupied orbitals, A and B are virtual orbitals. So you know that these matrices have these four indices and these X and Y are the amplitudes, so they are IA or JB. Uh, and basically you have this electric field which is the electric field integral in the MO basis here. So this would be the electric field generated by uh, this product of two orbitals. So you take the product of orbitals I and A, you have a density, you compute the electric field generated from this density, and then you mul multiply by the induced dipoles, by the dipole induced by JB. So, If you, um, you basically need to compute this transition, this induced dipoles, they are induced by a transition density. Okay, to, to see it more clearly, let's just look at TDA. So in TDA, you ha we have AX equals omega X for, for example, the case excited uh, state so if we need if we add this term to a basically we have a frequency shift that looks like this x transpose v pol x so if we compute this and we write down what it means it means something like this we have the electric field generated by the transition density 0k and these are induced dipoles but, but these dipoles are induced by the same transition density 0k the, the same transition electric field? Yes Okay. So basically you have a transition density it creates a field this field in induced dipoles and interacts with the same dipoles so for every atom in yes. the system, there's, uh, which has its polarizability, yes. which remains the same yes. upon excitation. Yes. Absolutely. Which I think which is, that's reasonable. Mm -hmm. uh, the transition, so the excitation from one state to another generates change in the field. Not the change, a transition. A transition. So this okay. is the field. Let, let's think, okay. If you did, yeah. 
Okay, so it looks like this. So let's say let's see what what it means physically. We have an electronic transition, so something like an oscillating dipole that induce transition dipoles in the environment. So dipoles oscillating at the same frequency, let's, let's say. And then interacts with this thing, these dipoles. So this is kind of a resonance term or dispersion term. It looks, looks kind of like the classical picture of dispersion, which is oscillating dipole, instantaneous dipole, induced dipole. But this is, this is a term that exists only in the excited state. So if, if we look more closely at this, it looks more like an exciton coupling. Uh, but basically, what we get, if, if we assume that these transition densities look like dipoles, so instead of a density we have just a dipole, this is your dipole, your QN dipole, transition dipole, induces a field, induces dipoles in the environment, which then interact again with this map. So we have two times the dipole, well, two, two dipole factors, so we have the square of the dipole, and of course this is proportional to the polarizability of the environment. Okay, so basically, this term is roughly proportional to the um, transition dipole of the 0k transition. So basically, if we have a bright transition, we have, this is a minus, we have a um, right shift, basically always. Um, but if the state is dark, this is zero and they are unaffected. So if you have in a polarizable environment one dark state and one bright state, their difference is going to be affected by the polarization, which is the important part here. Uh, just to show you that this is not a, a, a fluke, there is a real effect. If you take a non-polar solute, which is um, non-polar chromophore, beta-carotene, and you put it in two different non-polar solvents, and hexane and um, carbon disulfide. Carbon disulfide has a much, much larger polarizability than hexane, and you, sh you see that there is a substantial redshift. And this is all non-polar in non-polar. These are experiments. These are experiments from... I see, I see. They are here, but they're, they're, it's a different work. Um, it's a previous work. And if you take this, these are all non-polar carotenoids, carotenes, and you see that their excitation energy decreases almost linearly with the polarization of the solvent, polarizability of the solvent. So this depends on the uh, refraction units. And these solvents basically only have refraction units. The, the ones that they, they looked at here. Yeah, so, so basically what you say is you can uh, sort of, so the, the role of polarizability can be very quickly estimated. Yes. Uh, yes. Knowing. Yes. Exactly. Polarizabilities that are known and the transition yes. that are Basic. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So if, if, a, if a transition is bright, then I, I would say for a normal bright transition yeah. and normal environment around, yeah. and polarizabilities of different molecules or different atoms are not that different. Yes. yes. Um, you would expect a point a 0 0.2 electron volt to achieve. <coughs> okay. Give or take. This is absorption. In, in the absorption. Yeah. Okay. But again, this shouldn't depend too much on the geometry unless your state changes. Okay, so this is just one of the contributions. Are you um, 
Does the same rationale apply for emission? Yes, it does. So basically, exactly the, the same. It's just the other way around. Because um, okay, in in QMM and Paul, the induced dipoles represent electrons. Mm -hmm. So they are electronic polarizabilities, and in all of these, we assume that they are instantaneous, or at least we can expect that we have a low energy transition in the solute and the transitions of the environment will be higher energy, so faster. I see. So they are at least as fast. Otherwise, if your solvent has the same transitions as your solute, you have to treat, you have to treat them differently. Um, so this is just one of the contributions. Uh, an obvious contribution that you already have from the charges is that your environment changes the orbitals, changes the energies of the orbitals. So when you compute the excitation energies, this will give you a difference. So if you put charges, you have different excitation energies because you have different uh, orbitals. you don't have an explicit uh, part in the linear response equations, for example. Yeah, it's all one electron. So we have seen that if we take this linear response, we get um, an effect of the environment that makes sense, but it's just one contribution. Um, another contribution is what is called state-specific contribution. So this would be the response of the environment to a change in the QM electron density. So this is different because basically you have to, to think that you have a ground state, you have some dipoles that are induced by the ground state density, you change the electron density, you get to excited state density, this density changes, the electric field changes, and then the dipoles will, so, will also change. The dipoles of the environment. They, they, exactly. They okay. use dipoles will also change. Yeah. This is a different effect, which we call state-specific, in the sense that uh, we have a different contribution for each state. So each state has a different density, which gives you a different contribution. So if you compute this contribution, this was first done within continuum solvation models. You compute this contribution, uh, it's basically, you have, it's similar, um, uh, formula as before. Here you have the electric field induced by the difference density. Um, and this is the, these are the, the dipoles induced by the same difference density. And the difference density is, is the um, density difference between cave excited state and ground state. So this density difference, if you are in TDDFT, you can compute it, right? To compute it, you take this, which is called the unrelaxed density, that would be the density you compute in a CI expansion, but then you also have this term that um, is called zeta vector, and it has to be computed by solving these zeta vector equations. So if you, if you want your QM code, for example Gaussian, to compute the excited the excited state density with TDDFT, first you solve TDDFT equations, and then you have these zeta vector equations that are CPHF equations. And you compute this additional contribution. So this would be called the relaxed density. Why do you have this? Because basically this density gives you the correct dipole of the excited state. Like the dipole as uh, derivative of the energy with respect to the electric field. This relaxed density gives you the correct time. 
So if you have TDDFT, this is more complicated because you first have to compute your TDDFT and then compute the density and then compute these. And this is just an approximation because then you would change the density and then recompute. We don't do that, we do uh, this in a first order approximation. So basically, if we introduce the, the environment in linear response to DDFT with the derivative, with the Hessian, as you would do for linear response, you, you get one term, which is dispersion-like or resonance term. We call, we call it linear response term, so it's clear. And this is one effect. If you want to include this state-specific effect, you can you need to first calculate p delta and then compute this effect. And this is a correction. So correct linear response, what we call correct linear response is we exclude polarization from the A and B matrices, so we don't have this effect. But instead we compute the first order SS state specific correction. Okay, the problem is here is that you don't have gradients, or it's more complicated to have gradients because this is perturbative, and it also involves the calculation of the z-vector. So it's more difficult to have the derivatives. And to have the to, to do dynamics, you, you, you need perfect gradients. Um, what you can do is this also this CLR squared was called like this, where you include both the linear response term in the TDFT equations and this state-specific CLR correction. So you can have, you kind of have both uh, parts. Or another possibility is you exclude polarization from the ABA matrices and you don't compute anything else. This is called, we call it omega zero or pol GS. So this means you take the field from the ground state and then you don't put anything else in the excited state. Of course, in this case, in this omega zero case, you have the effect of both, of course, the charges, but also the dipoles on the ground state, so on the molecular orbitals. So the orbital energies are affected by both the um, both charges and the induced dipoles. Okay, so usually if you have kind of bright states without significant CT character, you can use this linear response framework which captures the largest part, 0 0.2 EV, more or less. But if you have significant CT character, then you exclude and you use um, just CLR, also because the LR part would be zero, because the transition dipole would be zero. Or if you have intermediate case, you use this CLR squared, you put both the effect. So um, all of this. Uh, makes sense when we are talking about TDDFT. It's completely different if we have state-specific methods. So methods where you compute... Now, TDDFT is a linear response method. Also, EON, CCSD, for, for example, is another linear response method. ADC2 is another linear response method or similar. So they all work basically the same. But we also have state-specific methods, for, for example, CASSCF. So these are inherently state-specific. So when you compute this excited state, they are computed in the same way as the ground state. But you don't, if you compute the excited states, you don't use state-specific, you, you use state average. But anyway, state average is the average of different state-specific calculations. So you variationally optimize the energy. Um, so, if we have state-specific methods, we can choose what, what 
which is the root, the state of interest, and the polarization would respond to that state. Uh, we haven't done this, but it would also possible it would also be possible to calculate the state average polarization response, whatever that means. Um, but then if you want this linear response term, dispersion vector, we have to add it later. So for example, by calculating the transition density or by estimating this, this effect from a TDDFT calculation. Um, yes, exactly. So um, these are two examples where basically this thing was done. So this is retina and rhodopsin um, with very high level cas 2 calculations. And if you compute um, retina alone, you are already quite close to the experiment. If you include QMMM, you overshoot by a bit. And then you can include the polarization just in the ground state, this pol GS, doesn't change much. Uh, you compute the polarizations in the state specific, it also doesn't change a lot. But then, this is polarizes this response, linear response term. Um, and if you include both effects of so this CLR squared, what would be called CLR squared, include both effects, you are very, very close to the experiment. So, um, if you do QMMM and with a very, very high level QM, you, you overshoot the experiment probably because you miss polarization. And of course, this retinal, it's, the S1 is a bright state. So we have, yeah, more or less it's 0 0.2, a bit less than 0 0.2. So each point is an average of different conformation? Uh, each point is an average of a very small sample. So, um, so this is retinal in its environment? Yes, in rhodopsin. Okay, uh, then this is a similar thing done with, uh, in, with different uh, GFTs. No, go, go ahead. Okay, this is the same thing done with different GFP, GFPs. Um, and turns out that you need both the state specific and the linear response term to get a nice correlation with the, um, with the experiment. So basically, if you use just um, polarization in the state specific, it's already good, but you're very far from the experiment, you get closer to the experiment if you, uh, if you have this linear response term. But if you look at it, basically, this linear response term is basically the same for all the transitions, because all the, for all the um, different GFPs, because the different chromophores have basically a transition with the same transition dipole moment. So the magnitude of the effect would be the same. So just looking at that plot again, so, so QMLM is 2.4, the... This one? No, I, the left one. So QMLM is 2.7. Oh wait, sorry, uh, my colors are wrong. Okay, so 2.7. You, you, you have to follow the dots. Follow the dots. Ah, okay, I see. Yeah. Oh, so QMLM is 2.7. And then... So it overshoots it by about just over 0.1 EV. Yeah. Maybe a bit more. Um, but basically, this, this difference is basically compensated again when you have the linear response term. So it's not huge. It's not huge. 0 0.1, 0 0.2 EV. It's not it's huge, but it's not small. It's not, yeah. It's it relative to the energy scales of, uh, you know, excitations. Yes. It's not. But but for example, if you take for example two transitions in the same molecule, yeah, 
for example, tryptophan or or um, anthracene. I don't know where you have two transition L A L B. Yeah, they are very. They have very similar energy, and the dark transition is usually lower in energy. But then this would give you a difference because the bright transition would be red shifted and the dark would, would be not. Yes. So in these cases, it could be important. If you are, if you are comparing different uh, GFPs, for example, mm -hmm. this would be completely systematic. So you probably don't care. I guess so. I'm wondering, um, would would one see bigger effects uh, for chromophores in liquids with different polarities? Yes, I with different polarities. Different polarities. Different, with different polarities. Yes, yeah. yes. Maybe kind of in in the protein. In the protein, you kind of have. Yes. You have sort of cancellation yes. of effects going yes. on, but if you have something uniform in the different solvents. Yes. Or if. If you are computing vacuum to solvent yeah. shifts, yeah, yeah, this yeah. is super important. Yeah. Right. Or I'm not sure about this, but also water to propane. Yeah. Right. Okay. So again, we are talking about spe specific methods. Another method is this excited state SCF, which is also called delta SCF. So this was something that was probably used a lot in the 80s or 90s, uh, it came back again in 2008 and then more recently because people um, basically understood that this can be much more accurate than TDDFT for some cases. So basically, you want to describe an excited state with a single determinant. Of course, you have to relax the, the molecular orbitals when you do this. Um, so, optimize in the sense that you relax, you change the molecular orbitals so they, that they match the excited state. So, you, you have to do a self consistent field, uh, which is different from the one in the ground state, because in the ground state you try to minimize the energy, you, are, you can only end up in the ground state. Here, you, you, you want to do a CF, but you, you, want, you don't want to get down on the ground state. So this is the difficult part. Um, so there are different methods here, the, the MOM or STEP methods. I'm not going to talk about them. Basically, um, you take an electron, you take an orbital and you take this electron and you change it. And this is a single determinant. So it's a broken symmetry solution. Uh, you try to not care about um, the fact that, that there's a broken symmetry so the spin is not correct. It's something halfway between singlet and triplet. So the rule of uh, Peter Gill, for example, is don't care about this. And of course, if you optimize the molecular orbitals, you get different energies for the molecular orbitals, but this, you can force it to remain on the excited state, basically. Um, and you can force it by telling the, 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 the algorithm to try to match the orbitals, like, more or less, this is the idea. Okay, what's nice about this and um, and polarization is that this is just self-consistent field. So the, the integration with polarizable embedding is completely straightforward. And it's the same you have on the ground state, which means that it's state specific. So if you do delta CF, um, you do state specific. So this is an example on uh, APA, which I showed you this morning. Um, so this is the QM part. Of course, we have all the protein around. And the excited state we are interested in is the CT state, where one electron goes from this tyrosine to the flavine. And this CT state 
So if, if you compute the excitation energy at the omega zero level or linear response, you see nothing changes because the transition dipole is zero and we say that this linear response effect depends quadratically on the transition dipole. So we get the same results. These are with different functionals. Sorry, this shift? Or does it with respect, shift? this is the shift with respect to the vacuum. Ah, okay. So if you look basically at the, this is basically charges or OGS, let's say. So charges and uh, ground state induced dipole. Okay, so this is a blue shift because the charges themselves seem to give a blue shift, but also the dipoles are polarized to the ground state. But then, if we let the dipoles polarize over the excited state, for example, with CLR squared, so we, we introduce this state specific correction into DDFT, we have 0.5. So this is huge because, well, it's huge because this charge separation is large. So here we have a strong charge transfer. And we compute the same shift with delta CF, we get basically the same thing. So with this, we kind of also validate this CLR, even if this shift is large. Um, and also, we, we can look at different frames um, and compare uh, locally, for the locally excited state, we compare delta CF with TDA. For the CT, with, with, uh, we compare delta CF with TDA. We get similar. So these are shifted by a constant, but they are similar, so uh, they are very correlated. So basically, delta CF and TD, DFT or TDA give similar effects. So this here in different frames, of course, the geometry changes, the QM geometry changes, the, the MM part changes, everything changes. But they are correlated, which means that there is a systematic difference between the two, but that's it. But of course, this is very useful because I showed you we can do, if we have SCF, it's much easier to compute excited states. It's much, it's much faster with respect to DDDFT. So it's faster, it's state specific. So when state specific is important, for example, for city states, it's uh, probably a very good choice. And of course, it was demonstrated that. Uh, so the, so this is this is only good for absorption. This is good. Why exactly. do you say? No, no, for exactly. uh, if you want to do dynamics, you can do dynamics. You can. I, I will show. We, we did these dynamics with Delta C yeah, for alpha. Okay. Uh, yeah, but there's no surface of. No, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, people, Sandra Ruger in, uh, uh, yeah. in Zurich. In Zurich, yeah. yeah. She did, if I remember correctly, she, she implemented surface hopping with Delta CF. Okay. But it's, it's a bit more complicated because this is a state specific method, so the, actually the excited state won't be orthogonal to the ground state. So, even to compute transition densities or transition properties, one has to be careful. But you can, you can, if you have just two states, you can orthogonalize easily. That's okay. Um, or one does this non-orthogonal CI. I don't remember what exactly they do for surface hopping, but they do surface. Hopping. Okay, so uh, I, sh I showed you that there are two different models for excited states. So uh, depending on what you do, you get different um, 
different parts that go in. So uh, why does this happen? Uh, it turns out, or at least uh, Stefano Coveni demonstrated this for continuum salvation models, for Edmund Pod it's exactly the same thing, just different different objects you have. Um, so the ambiguity arises from the fact that we have a quantum classical partition and we basically assume that the, the, the total ground state is a Hartree product of the QM state times an environment state. So if you think about um, if you think about the, the theory of intermolecular interactions, it is very similar. And in the theory of intermolecular interactions, uh, you can start from this to, to, to derive the electrostatic interaction between A and B, and also the uh, mutual polarization. Because basically polarization, you can, you can see polarization as a sum over the excited states or mutual polarization or you can see it as a rotation in, within the QM space, within a, a space over the B space. So you adapt the QM wave function, you adapt environment wave function, which means you adapt the diverse. And this all works out for the ground state. Or for an excited state that is isolated from everything else. The problem is this doesn't work in general, because in general you would have a linear combination of different states. So if you use a minimal model, you will need to combine um, all of these products between a function of the QM part and of the environment. And at some point you need to substitute the wave function for the environment with a classical object. So um, Stefano uh, Corny did all, all of this and it turns out that this accounts for both polarization and dispersion terms. So you know and this is how you demonstrate that this linear response term is something that exists really. And it's a dispersion like. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, to summarize this part, so we have this ambiguity in, in the QM classical partition, which gives rise to the discrepancy between these two different methods of uh, getting the excited state. Um, but both of these effects are physical, so we would like to introduce, in, in principle, to introduce both. The problem is, if you have a linear response approach, you automatically have this one of the two contributions. The other effect needs to be calculated in another way. And this gives you the problem that it's more expensive computationally, and also you don't have the gradients. And then, um, another thing is that this linear response term is quadratic in the combination of the state, which makes sense, whereas the S, S is not. So, for the, this effect, the delta over the LR, you can see it like an average of some kind of operator over the excited state. But this you can't because the density, this delta density itself is quadratic on the state. So this actually is something strange. So if you have two combinations of the excited states which give you the same density, you would have the same result even if in reality you would need different results. So for example, you can think of two excited states which are a plus b minus and a minus b plus if you combine them like half and half the total density would be neutral 
and the state specific would respond to a neutral density, but in reality you shouldn't respond to a neutral density. So this is a bit complicated. So what one would need to do would be to use an operator, but this would be very, very com complex. Okay, so I want also to show you some uh, parts of molecular dynamics with polarizable QMM. Maybe let's take a short break. Short break, yes. To, so, just a question. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so the, in these polarizable models, there's no charge transfer, right? You mean within? Within. Between, no, no. Yeah. no. And do you know anything about these? Because I know that there have been some, like Hippo has ah. some parts, uh, some charge transfer contribution. I, no, I right don't here. know much. Okay. I don't think this would be very important. It would, it would not be. Mm. Unless you have some specific system where you have really charge transfer, you can measure, like, you can compute QM that you have a lot of charge transfer and that you cannot get the same effect with just polarization. Right. I didn't know about that. So, because you, you know, you can think of polarization, so charge transfer is like the extreme form of a long range polarization. Yes. Right. And uh, to what extent a polarizable model mm. allows for the physics of longer range spatial polarization. Yeah. It does. It doesn't. Which, of course, in the full blown uh, electronic structure, it yes. would be there. Yes. Um, but I, uh, I can't think of a case where, where this is this would be important, and you cannot put it into into the third part. So, so ah, you can't. Okay. Because. I mean, the, the, the answer would be put this into, into the QM part. Put it into the QM part. So for example, okay, I'm thinking, let's say I have a salt. Oh. A salt in water. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the charge on, let's say, a chloride ion. Yeah. Uh, gets smeared, gets on, smeared the on the water. Yes. And so, which you will not get from a polarizable potential. You would, yes. I so, so I, I'm thinking in, yeah, in the context of in, in, in liquids, liquid like water mm. interacting with ions. Um, okay. Uh, I don't know. I think there are works that compare for sure QMMM with QM with. Yeah. But they are not very clear, probably. No, no, no. no sure. uh, well, one has to try. Yeah, no, no, no. Right. And, but one, you, you would need to be very, very careful because very careful to have a QM method that is reliable. Uh, absolutely. In this case, yeah. it's like that doesn't over... Over delocalize, delocalize yeah. charge track, yeah. Self-interaction, uh, yeah. so business. Okay. okay, so if you want to take a break, you run yes. this. Let's start again from where we left. So, molecular dynamics, which is, I mean, something we are all interested in ground state or excited state. So basically, uh, to do MD, we need accurate gradients for both, of course, the QM energy and also for the QMM interaction. This is also true for optimizations, but probably for MD we need more accurate gradients. And also we need a complete force field if we want to do something moving also the MM, MM part. So basically we could do, if we don't have a complete force field, we can move just the QM part with a frozen MM part or just do optimization. But if we want to do an actual QM-MM dynamics, 
we need also to describe the entire uh, MM part. So this is why we need to use, for example, amoeba, which is a bit cumbersome, as I showed you. And of course, we need, so we, we have this, we have amoeba, and we need an interface between MD engine and QM program. So what we have is this kind of interface. So this is a triple, let's say, interface between Tinker, Gaussian, and Plumen. So basically what we do in Tinker is we have position, we compute the energy and forces, and we integrate the equation of motion. So Tinker computes all the known electrostatic non-bonded forces and all the bonded forces, of course for the MM part, and then it runs Gaussian. Gaussian has position, MM parameters, and QM, QM settings. Only positions are passed to Gaussian. These are already known somewhere. Gaussian solves the SCF, maybe the, the post-SCF, so the excited state, for example, computes the forces and computes all the electrostatics and polarization. So all the MM electrostatics is computed here, computed here in Gaussian. Then you have all the energy and all the uh, QM forces and contribution to, M to MM forces. And it must be in Gaussian, right? Right now, yes. And then back to Tinker, then if we need we run Plumed with to, to get bias forces, for example, constraints, restraint, actually restraints, um, uh, biases. We want, for example, we, we don't use peri periodic boundaries, so we have this droplet. So, for example, we have a bias that keeps waters inside the droplet. All of this, all of this, you have the forces and, and you do the dynamics. Um, right now we are using a development version of Gaussian, which is, I mean, sooner or later will be out, hopefully. And one nice thing about these interfaces, it's all based on these binary files. We don't write text, so it's much faster. And another thing that I will show you is that we have a procedure to extrapolate the SCF solution. Um, so, before this, what is also important is to have an efficient implementation of QMM poll because you don't want the MM part to be a bottom. So here, the, the computationally expensive parts of the, of the MM part are computing the electric field integrals because you have to compute the electric field mu nu integral for each mm atom so it's a lot and of course also the potential and for amoeba also the gradients gradient relation of the electric field you have to compute all of this and also you need to compute all the interactions between induced dipoles. So these are a lot of computations. Only with fast multiples this is possible. So if you use fast multiples and iterative solution with preconditioned gradient, you basically get linear scaling in the size of the MM part. I don't go more into these details because this is Filippo's territory, let's say. <laughs> And another thing that Filippo did, uh, together with uh, uh, Eric Kansas and Benjamin Stam, would, would be this um, extrapolation of density matrices. And this works like this. We, have, we are at some point during the dynamics, we have positions in some previous step, and we have the SCF solutions, for example, density matrix, uh, D at this previous step, we want to have a guess of the density
density matrix at the new step so that we can reduce the number of SCF iterations at each and this step. So ideally, I would want directly the solution here. But of course, it's not so easy. Uh, having a density mat matrix that's close to the solution would be also very good. So what's the problem here? The problem is that you cannot just combine density matrices because density matrices, um, one particle density matrices, live in a curved space. So a combination of a de of density matrices with some coefficient is not a density matrix. Sorry, sir. So you are using uh, a couple of density from the previous step, only, yes. only the last one. Exactly. So let's say I have Q previous steps and number of previous steps. And I want to use the results of this previous step to guess the density matrix for the new step. So what some something people do is we take as a guess the previous one, which is fine, but it's dangerous. Like it's dangerous because you, you kind of introduce a bias. So you have to convert this very finely. But isn't it more likely that the DN uh, should be closer to the step before than the one that's... For sure. But so why do you... Well, this gives... Because you are just using the same density as N minus 1 instead. This extrapolation tries to find what, what would be the density here using all of this. So if this was a linear space, you would try to combine these in some way. You cannot combine the density matrices because the space is, is not linear. So what people do is this, for example, extended Lagrangian formulation where you combine with predefined coefficients. Right. So it's called X and B O. Uh, you combine with, with coefficients, you don't get the density matrix. You get something that's very close. And what you do is you use purification, for example, McWin purification to get an actual density matrix. Um, what we want to do what Philippe did was a different way, which is, so density matrices live in this curved space. You can project this onto a tangent space so that here, this tangent space is a vector space. So we call um, gamma is a function of the density matrix and vice versa, density matrix is a function of gamma. So you can go back and forth. You define a point where you compute the tangent. So you have a reference point, let's say. Everything else, you can go back and forth between one and the other. So if you have Q density matrices, you have Q of these gamma vectors. You can combine them with coefficient and then go back into this curved space, which is called a Grassmann manifold. Um, so you you are um, you uh, always get an actual density matrix. Actually, you don't get directly the density matrix. You get the MO coefficients. So the coefficients of occupy the most. But this is all you need for a guess. <clears throat> so then you can use this as a guess for... Um, and how many steps pre prior to... What's the optimal number? So, from some trials, they, they decided that 6 is a good... Uh, so Q equals 6. They tried probably from 3 to 9. Because if you go too much farther, 
you, you are too far. You, you need something where all these points are close, so the extrapolation is linear. Right, 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 right. I see. So you can do a linear extrapolation, but just because you are in the tangent space. So the extrapolation is linear, you can do this, and uh, basically, if you compare uh, extended Lagrangian with Gras this is called Grassmann ext extrapolation, uh, this is the number of SCF steps, SCF iteration cycles you need to converge to time 10 to the minus 7. Uh, basically, with XLBO you need 5 iteration, with Grassmann you need less than 4. Uh, this is OCP, this, this system, a carotenoid in, with, with these two residues in a protein, so this is more than 100 QM atoms. Uh, this is APA, but just the flavin. You need more than seven iteration with extended Lagrangian. You need less than five with Grassmann extrapolation. And if I remember um, the timings, these are, of course, this depends on the uh, on the architecture and on the uh, how many cores you have. Basically, we do five picoseconds a day for this and two picoseconds per day for which is already let's say nice so the community hasn't gone in this uh, into uh, neural networks yet no no, no. Um, this just linear linear extrapolation yeah. Okay, um, so right now this is, uh, okay, initially this was not uh, time, res time reversible. They have a new, so this, this reference is not time reversible, there is a new uh, way to do this extrapolation so that it's almost time reversible, which of course improves the stability of the trajectory. So the goal here is to have the, the um, uh, less tolerance on the SCF convergence, but still have a stable trajectory. So yeah, the problem. So XLBO gives you uh, time reversibility, and so it always gives you gives you a stable trajectory, but you need more more iterations. These with with these parameters, the trajectory is stable and you need fewer iterations. And so I showed you the uh, delta CF dynamics. So these are all CPU. All CPU, yes. Delta CF dynamics, you need this. If you don't have this, you cannot even do dynamics. If you do extrapolation, you can do dynamics because you are um, you enforce the system to stay in the same state. So the gas has to be very good for excited state SCF, and with Grassmann extrapolation it works. With extended Lagrangian it doesn't work at all because probably extended Lagrangian uh, assumes that you are in the ground state. It doesn't work at all. Okay, so capabilities of the thing are resumed here in this review. All QM amoeba dynamics can do this more on the dynamics than in properties. Um, I want to finish with an overview of the OpenMMPOL library because, okay, we have all of this within. Um, this Gaussian interface, which right now, nowadays, is not very good. We want to do something open source. So we developed, I mean, Mattia developed this library. So this is almost 100% Mattia's work. Um, so he worked on this between 2022 and late 2023, and right now. Uh, 
um, so the idea is to have an open source code, an open source library to interface open mmpol, uh, open uh, mmpol or amoeba polarizable environment, and of course also non polarizable to any virtually any QM code. So all the MM side should be taken care of. This is the idea. So it's written in Fortran, but it's modern Fortran, has interface, very smooth interfaces to C, C++, and Python. Um, and everything is dynamic allocation. So parallelized with OpenMP and can be distributed as shared library. So compile, you, you get a .so and you link it to your QM code. Um, so, what, what can we do with this? We can, um, so, MMPOL or Amoeba, so normal charts and, and induced dipoles or strange Amoeba stuff. Analytical gradients, so we can do MD and geometry optimization. Atoms can be frozen. Link atoms are possible, and we are we have everything, so all MM terms, bonded and bonded, so no, no need of using Tinker. Um, so, but alone can only do the MM part, also polarizable, but you need a host QM code, so we built a, a nice interface to PySCF. The reason is PySCF is also open source and easy to tinker with. So right now with the PySCF interface, we can do DFT ground state with gradients, so MD, MP2 energy almost done, uh, optimization with this geometric uh, library, TDDFT energies and working on gradients, and also ADC, DC2, with this ADC connect, which is a bit slow, but it's there. Um, so right now, uh, the electrostatic is quadratically scaling, so we don't have FMM right now. Uh, so up to 10K atoms is completely feasible, but of course, doing more MM atoms uh, starts becoming complicated. Let's say sure. so. Right here is fine. Up to here, then we start hitting the quadratic scaling. Is this the interface you tried? Uh, no, we were trying to do these uh, tests on uh, glutamine. On the parameters. Yeah. No, 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 it was a bit tinker. It was a tinker. So now we don't need to use tinker. Well, probably for the parameterization, yes. Ah. Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately. Um, so we were having trouble with getting parameters polarizabilities. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. We can. We can. Yeah. 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 Talk about. It. Okay. So the most difficult step is for the force is the is uh, computing the force, and another important part is the electric field integrals because these has to have to be computed by the QM code and they are generally slow. Gaussian has very, very good integral code. No one else does. Uh, so when you have 100,000 mm atoms and you need to compute the field, uh, field gradient and so on on all of these atoms, then it becomes a bottleneck. Any way you can do something like this. And the, the, the paper is actually out. I forgot to put the reference, but you look for OpenMM poll. Uh, so basically, right now we, we have different ways to uh, initialize, describe the MM system. One is this format, which is what we used with, together with Gaussian. It's called MMP. It cannot be used for uh, MD simulation because it doesn't have all the MM parameters, let's say. It only has the, the charges and polarizabilities. 
So it's good for, for example, um, single points. And then you can need, you can read Tinker files. So basically, for Amoeba, you can just use uh, the Tinker preparation or a binary file that is uh, corresponds to all the data, but we we can kind of generate it with OpenMM Paul, I'm not sure we can do everything. And we can transform this XYZ plus PRM5 to this MMP for just for us. Um, and then all the information that's needed is collected in a JSON file. So this collects like what to do, what file is the XYZ and so on what to read and so uh, and all the settings, repository, you could have distance it and so on. So ideally within PySCF you read this JSON file. And then you call the library. Um, so basically if you already have XYZ plus PRM file, you're you're done. You're basically done. Um, and then you can generate the JSON and this cut XYZ file containing just the MM part. And then you can provide. So basically you have to prepare the input files and yeah, right now you basically need to have XYZ and PRM, and PRM file for the entire system and then the uh, preparation will cut. Um, so the idea is to try the official procedure for Amoeba, which is not something easy, uh, but it's doable. It's an art. Some sweat. <laughs> and then you can use this to split the QAnon and generate JSON input and so on. Um, so, this would be the JSON file, name, description, where is the XYZ file, where is the PRM file, with MD, MD5 sum because uh, Mattia is a bit uh, <laughs> overthinking, maybe. What are the link atoms? And the QM part would be here. Uh, and of course, you need a PRM also for the QM part because the bundle was, for example, would be. So let me ask. So the model, this, it's always a cluster. Yes. And so you never had any issues with the, let's say the, the pressure gradient between. Um, so. You can you can do two things to avoid this. You either freeze the outer, the outer shell, shell yes. it's super easy to yeah, yeah. do this at the time, or you introduce um, a wall, a potential like this. I see. So at some at some cut, so and up to here the potential is zero. Is the radius. And from here, you so it is you perfect. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. And you can basically decide this radius to have a certain uh, density. I see. Okay. This is because basically periodic boundary conditions are not possible. All of this is already open source. Yes. So if, for example, if you want to study a system in which there are parameters, you can. Yes. Try. And if something does not work, we ask Matia. Uh, in general, there are parameters for, for all the amino acids. Yes, all amino acids are there because it's in the Amoeba Bio 18. Okay. Everything should be there. So, but these, these PRM files you should download from Tinker because they don't want us to uh, distribute them. 
or maybe we do anyway, but we should. Yeah. Sure. So our problem is that we have this. This has to be a This L pi Yes. Yeah, so we. Ah, have, but yeah, because it's, it's not a, exactly. So what has to do with the parameterization of that? E yes, I think so. So, okay. Either you try to assign. The yeah, at I, I, I think I yeah, think I tried have, to do this, but yeah. M -M Right. 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 It's a bit complicated because I think it's an art. You yeah, because Tinker requires and especially Amoeba requires a lot of information and it has a lot of atom types. Yes. So each atom is a different atom type. Then it has the atom class that it's what you would call atom type everywhere else. And, and let me ask you, do, in your system, do you have a, do you typically is the water mostly mm? It's not. It's a non-polarizable water. No, you, water is polarized. It is polarized. Ah, yes. Okay. It depends. Uh, basically, we have polarizable water, uh -huh. um, but basically, um, if you are use, if you are doing single point, you can just put polarization on the inner sphere. And then you don't care. Yeah. Um, right now, th this was to to avoid uh, having to like, to avoid computationally expensive uh, calculation. But right now that we have fast multiples, it's probably not even needed. Um, but in the dynamics, may maybe you can still. Save something if the outer layer is mm, but then you have to fit to freeze all the mm part. So every frozen atom is also non polarizable, and every polarizable atom then they are separated. Okay, uh, and then within by SCF, you basically load the QM, um, so get the QM part. And then create the PySCF object, and then here you add an ball. <coughs> and I think there are examples in the PySCF. So right now we have on GitHub, on one side we have the OpenMPOL library that you compile with CMake. And on the other side, we have the PySCF interface, which is PySCF modified by us. Still on GitHub, and you compile. So, no, so I just want to make sure. I, so the QM part uh, still requires Gaussian. No, no, no. This is all done by PySCF. QM is PySCF. Okay. Ah, cool. Okay. So this because. Basically, in polarizable embedding, it's, I mean, you have to modify the QM code. Because, at least for SCF, you need to put something into the fork matrix. So, basically, there is no escape from this. I mean, there is an escape, but I, I really, personally, I don't like this. I mean, the escape is, um, you only polarize the dipoles, but the, the QM density doesn't change. Doesn't change. But this, this is strange. completely defeats the purpose. Um, so, yeah. What's the difference between the ISCF that you guys have and the normal ISCF? There is inside this part, other other than pole, that computes. That does what, what we have to do, basically. Let's go back. Back, back, back. That's, for example, here. So, here you have to compute this potential on the potential from the mm on from the QM on the MM atoms. So we do this, potential and field, 
then this is open MM pole, this is open MM pole, but then this is a back to the QM code because you have to assemble this contribution to the FOC matrix and you have to put it back into the FOC. And right now, uh, not sure about the ISCF interface, but um, these and these, you need all these matrix elements, okay? And this is basis function times basis function, number of basis function times number of basis function times number of atoms. So you have one integral like this for every atom. Then you have to both sum on MUNU here to have this, but you also sum, you also contract with the dipos here. So basically, if you don't have enough memory to, to put all these matrices, these matrix in memory, you have to do by batches or iterative. So this has to be computed more than one time unless it's small. So all of this has to be done on the QM side. So there is some work on the QM side. And in PySCF it's re relatively easy. But we are building um, an interface with DFTB together with Marcus Elsner. Um, and we are starting to do something also with Mopac. Of course, from the QM side, it's not super easy. So, of course, we can treat all the part that doesn't need the QM side itself. But of course, these are these are calculated different differently or dealt with differently in each QM code. So you basically have to know the QM code. But then the interface is very clear. And th there is no way around it. If you have if you need something efficient, almost efficient, you need this. So otherwise it's a mess. So if you have a, a protein with I don't know Eighty amino, hundred amino acids, with a, a bath of water. What's the? Like if you get how many picoseconds a day? With well, it depends on the QM part. Let's say you want to treat everything. Uh, so, so, oh, wait. What I mean is, um, yeah. So let's say you had twenty atoms in the QM region, okay? And you had everything. You wanted the whole protein, all the water, polarized. I, I don't know with PySCF, but okay. I think it's a few picoseconds per day. Okay, I see. Okay. Uh, maybe this is written in the yeah. okay. open and paper. Okay, so I think I am at the end. So just to have the acknowledgements. So. Mattia, who started the um, Open and Paul project and did almost all of it, and also Dr. Tommaso Nottoli, uh, who is now working together with Mattia uh, Danza on the library and on the interface, and of course Filippo, who made all the theory and the first implementation in Gaussian and the Grassman of the separation and so on. And Patrizia also, who worked on the Grossman extrapolation um, for the quasi time reversible, and, and Dr. Michele Notto, I don't have the picture anymore. He also worked on the communication of Amigo. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So yeah, in principle, the standard system would be good. Uh, yeah, non, non, yeah, standard amino acids. Yeah. Yes. I mean, at least to try the yeah. 
interface and yeah, yeah, yeah. see if everything works. I don't know if you already tried to, to use the code. No, what I was trying is to parameterize the, okay. the system. I Maybe. was following okay. a tutorial that Matthias shared with me. Okay. Yeah, it's, I know it's a bit complicated. I mean, I, I, personally, I didn't ever try. Patricia tried once, <laughs> and it took her a few days. But um, if you want, um, well, let's talk about it because we have a different preparation um, pipeline that was done for Gaussian, but it creates these MMP files, um, which are fine for single point calculation. So maybe if it's just to try something, we can start from there. Because the reason why it's complicated is because every time every force field, polarizable force field, has different exclusion rules, different uh, also rules for, for the screening. So Amoeba has exponential screening. <coughs> Amber and Paul has linear screening. They are completely different, so the polarizabilities will be different to reproduce the same molecular polarizability. And also, the charges or fixed multiples uh, have to be derived together with the polarizability. Because, um, let's say you have charges, the charges will polarize the dark holes, right? So then you have to see the, 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 the charge, the electrostatic potential from the charges and the induced dipoles in total should reproduce the electrostatic potential right. of the QM calculation. I think one of the problems with our, this pyroglutamine system mm -hmm. is because even in the ground state it has this acid-based chemistry. Yeah, this is and complicated. It's complicated. So I think it's it's a system the way coming up with potentials is probably not meaningful. I don't, I don't think know about that. <clears throat> don't worry. But for for the parameters, so the QM part we will do QM. Yeah, the dimer in which you observe this proton transfer. Oh, no, I'm, yeah. But the MM. No, it's not. Yeah, this is true, uh, but I can see how it is. Maybe we can stop the recording. recording. Yeah, yeah, we can stop the recording. I don't know how to do it. Ah, wait. Uh, I, I'm I, not sure we can. I think they do it. Okay. Sure it's it's no, it, it is. Okay. Because there was a sign out in the minutes. Stop sharing. Yeah, it's here, it's recording. Okay. So, uh, they, they, no, stop. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs>